first of all, thanks everyone for joining. My name is Trevor Laughlin. I'm the VP of product here at Intopology. In uh, today's session of uh, Intop Live, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time going into the simulation workflow in a little bit more detail than you may have uh, seen it uh, before in some of our other content. So uh, before we kind of get into the software and, and talk about more detail, I just want to start with, you know, why, why do we have this simulation capability in the software at all? And so for us, for us, what we really wanted to do was, you know, give, give our users, give engineers uh, an integrated set of tools so that they could do uh, simulation in a single connected workflow. So it's not that we expect to uh, displace existing simulation software. You know, a lot of our customers, they're, you know, uh, there's company or program policies that uh, simulations eventually need to be done in a, a specific piece of software. But for us, having these tools in one place so that you can integrate them into your workflow and do some initial trade studies and design analysis up front, that's really um, what the value we are focused on deliver with our tools. So um, just to get started, when you open the software, if you've seen it before, we have a whole bunch of tabs across the top. One of them is called simulation. And when you look at that, you'll see a whole bunch of different um, categories in here. So there's different types of analyses from static analysis, modal, buckling, and thermal. There's some uh, tools here to put together a finite element model, tools here to define material properties, including isotropic, orthotropic materials, mesh generation, boundary conditions, and, and this family here is a lot of the topology optimization capabilities. And so this tab, just to kind of bring focus to thing, this is really where all of the core simulation blocks are uh, that, we, that we have. And so what I'm gonna do just to uh, get things a little bit focused is go ahead and turn off everything else except two of the tabs. And we'll, we'll talk on design analysis in just a little bit. So um, so simulation tab has all the tools there. And um, just as an example, uh, to kind of bring open a file of what it looks like when you uh, build a workflow with one of those tools. So it may start by importing a CAD part, um, and then working through this, this notebook here with all these comments, doing some mesh generation, and eventually applying some boundary conditions all the way down to uh, finally doing, doing your analysis. And so this is uh, this example notebook here is using kind of the, the core tools that are found in the simulation tab. Um, so if you really want more fine-tuned control over some of the meshing parameters or how you define your material properties, you'll find a lot of those tools uh, in there. Um, so what I'm gonna do real quickly is just kind of jump over and talk about this design analysis tab, which is our design analysis toolkit. And so what that is, is we've taken a lot of the core simulation capabilities and more or less packaged them up into uh, a little bit uh, more targeted uh, sets of tools to get through the workflow a little bit faster. So I'm gonna be using that today to kind of uh, run through some things, but all the, all the tools that are uh, in blocks that are shown in this design analysis tab are all built up from the, like the core tools um, that are, are placed on the, the simulation uh, tab. So just as a, um, to kind of show you what the workflow looks like, we're just gonna do a really simple um, analysis here on uh, just this simple simple bracket, nothing fancy, but just to kind of show what some of the steps look like. And so uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mesh this part, we're gonna apply some loads on this face, gonna apply some restraints on this face, and that'll be it. So to get started, um, I'm just going to create my CAD body and I'm gonna select this face here, call this my loaded face, and then I'm gonna go in and select some faces in here that are going to be where we restrain the part. So we have a list of faces here. I'm gonna label them that way. Normally, I, when I build these notebooks, I put comments in all here just to keep everything clean, but just uh, 
to get going, we'll, we'll leave those out for now. So we have our some of our CAD uh, extracted. I'm just gonna pick some kind of sample material um, here, make it a variable. Going to generate a mesh, so FE CAD solid mesh. So this is a, a toolkit block that just takes a single CAD body. You can input an edge length, pick a geometric order, and it should do all the uh, the meshing of the of this CAD part uh, under the hood. So you get that as an output here to start. So let's make this a variable, just keep it here for reference. The next thing we're going to do is kind of assemble this into the model. So we're gonna take our final element mesh and that material that we define, and we're gonna get, get what's called this, this FE model, which is essentially the, the mesh plus the material definition uh, combined um, in one place. So with the model, um, we're going to apply some loads and boundary conditions. So selection sets is different ways to select uh, entities on your mesh to apply boundary conditions. In this case, we're going to use this FE face boundary, which takes in a list of CAD faces, the mesh, and you can pick different entities that you're going to select. And so I'm going to take my loaded face, put it here, take my FE mesh. This is the mesh we're going to select from and just say nodes. And you can see it select nodes here. If you had a reason to select edges or to select faces, you could also do that. We'll stick with nodes. Uh, then we're gonna jump over to uh, the restraints here. So uh, fixed faces is just another uh, toolkit block to kind of accelerate your workflow. And in this case, it's gonna take my restrained faces, put them in here, put my mesh in, and you kind of see you get some restraint clips showing up. And so, one more step just to apply a force. Uh, we have this force block. We're gonna take that face boundary. Um, so this is the boundary that we're gonna apply this force to. Just gonna make up some numbers here and get some applied force. And so at this point you have a final element model and a set of boundary conditions. The next thing you need to do is pick your analysis. So we'll just do a simple static analysis. We'll increase this length list length of uh, this list of boundary conditions to two. We'll put our restraints and our applied force there, and we'll put the model in. And then the analysis just should start running, and we'll see outputs here in just a second. And so that's kind of the the basic workflow. You can import a CAD model, select some uh, CAD entities to to generate you know generate your mesh some boundary conditions and, and get an analysis going. Um, what this looks like, I'll open a new file here. Um, that is the same workflow, but kind of what it looks like if you do kind of go through and document it so you have a nice um, uh, kind of top to bottom way to read what's happening in this file. And so that's convenient. I mean, I, I, we'll show some uh, examples here just in a little bit of some more complex geometry. This is a very simple example just to get a feel for kind of the workflow. Um, one thing I did want to, to highlight is if you have this workflow and if you do want to take the time to, to set it up, you can really take advantage of this, this notebook and all the connected uh, the blocks um, in your workflow. So this sample file, what I'm showing here is the same thing that we just saw, but there's a few differences. So what I did was I created these reference points out in space here. And it may not look like much, but if we were to, let's say import that part that we just saw, you can see that they kind of sit mostly in the middle of where these, uh, the faces that we previously selected are for, low, for our boundary conditions. And so what I've done here is I've used some different tools down here to select which uh, entities get restraints and apply loads. Basically, what happens is um, this point when the mesh gets generated is going to project to the, the face and it's going to do a flood fill selection of all the entities. So it's a little bit extra work, but what you can do with that is if you go into your part, let's say you grabbed its CAD body and put it here in this input, the whole workflow is just going to fire off and it's going to uh, do the same thing as far as like selecting these faces and applying the boundary conditions and get your result. Now, what's nice about this is, um, let's say now you have this workflow wired up from, from this CAD body. If a design change happened and you wanna to point to a different file, maybe say bracket two, 
this whole workflow is going to import the part, feed that body into this input, and then just run the whole process over again. And because we use these kind of uh, function-based ways of selecting these faces for boundary conditions, when a new part comes in or a mesh regenerates, um, you can still reapply the boundary conditions and rerun the analysis. Um, so one something that's a little bit uh, a little bit different, another variation where the hole is cut out and two members here. The point is that the whole workflow is just rerunning. Once you have it built, um, you can change things and uh, just keep um, keep doing iterations. One thing that's kind of nice, I think in, in previous webinars, we've talked about, you know, we, we talked about automation, we've talked about this concept of compound blocks. So it's interesting, we have, um, if you can imagine maybe you're a simulation person who's responsible for analyzing this bracket here, you know the boundary conditions, you know the loads, you know different settings for how this should be meshed, but you want to share this with maybe a design engineer who's doing some uh, doing some edits still to the geometry. So what we can do is I'm just going to clear that out. I'm going to make this CAD body an input. You can kind of see these sections. So you have inputs, body, and then an output. So I'm going to make that an, uh, an input. Maybe in the applied force, I'm going to take that uh, this vector, make it a variable, but then make it an input. And then the output of this workflow, I'm going to take my analysis result and make it the output. And then what I'm going to do is uh, save this file. And I've got one made that has a uh, already that is the same thing, but with some cleaned up um, comments. But I would save this as an in-top file. And if I have, if I start a new file here. What I'm going to do is import that in top file. Nothing's going to happen at first, but now if I, let's say I import my CAD part, uh, select a CAD body. Now, what you'll notice if you go back into this uh, search bar here and the notebook name of that file that we just saved was something like, you know, bracket analysis, or some simple automated bracket analysis. So now it shows up, it's just essentially you just made a new block in the system you click that and the inputs are what, what we saw in our previous notebook, the input can body and the uh, this force vector. So if I input that here, what's gonna happen is that same workflow we saw in the previous uh, notebook is gonna run essentially under the hood, but do the, do the same thing. Uh, but it only presents itself as one single block. So you just created your own, uh, your own new block in the system and it can, you know, like anything else that can be uh, you could expose more parameters. You, you could include geometry, you can include, include simulation. It could be anything, you know, maybe the load's changed and you can rerun this analysis real quick in a simplified way, or at least it's presented more simply. And the user who made the original workflow, um, we like to call them authors, like they have control over what parameters are exposed to the end user. Um, so that's that's one way, it's just a, a, a nice, uh, aspect of blocks and workflows and putting this all together is um, when, when things change upstream, you know, the whole workflow reruns, then on top of that, being able to package this up into something that you can reuse or share with colleagues is, um, uh, is, is, is pretty fun to, to see happen. So real quick, there's a few other things I wanted to uh, uh, highlight here before we wrap things up. So we like to talk about fields a lot. And I just wanted to point out that even in the simulation workflow, wherever it made sense, we uh, allow the user to use fields to, and this, this example is shown using the field to define material properties. Um, so we have this simple box here. This is just a, a simple example. Basically what this is doing is we have a plane and as a function of the distance from this plane, we are using this ramp block here to say, um, to essentially map different, uh, what is gonna become the, the Young's modulus for the material. So this becomes a field. And then when you define your material, uh, you can see these icons here that there are these field icons. That's kind of your indicator that some spatially varying uh, value could be put in here. So for this demonstration, I'm just inputting this spatially varying material field. And then what happens is uh, when you run the analysis and what we're doing here is just we're clamping one side of this box and just pulling on the other just to get like a uniform uh, tension. Just to highlight, uh, if you look at the stress values, 
through the thickness of this uh, part, you can see as the elastic modulus changes with your kind of constant strain, the stress value is changing. So just as a, uh, if, if you do find yourself working in this simulation workflow, um, there's some other things we have, uh, not only material properties, but some of the boundary conditions as well. Uh, pressure is a good example. You'll see this icon here. So spatially varying loads um, uh, is another place where we've injected fields fields into the simulation workflow. So that uh, we found some interesting use cases for that. Uh, to move on, let's see. There's a couple things to show here at the end. So something that's a little bit more, you know, at least has some lash geometry in it. So there's part of what we wanted to do with, with the simulation set of tools was there's usually not one one tool or one representation for, for all tasks. And so there's, when you get into uh, the tool set, you'll see the ability to analyze using beam elements, shell elements, solid elements, um, you know, depending on what assumptions you wanna make, depending on what stage of the design process you're in, there's there's different tools for each one of those. And so we wanted to make sure that that our users had the tools they need to, uh, to get the job done. So this was an example of um, a solid part with some lattice uh, infill here in the middle. And in this case, what we're doing is we're gonna use a tie constraint um, to connect the beam lattice to the surrounding structure. And so what that, uh, what that means is that, oops, turn this back on. The mesh of the lattice and the mesh of the surrounding solid structure is, is not gonna uh, they're not necessarily connected, but the tie constraint is going to essentially enforce the motion of the end nodes of the lattice here to the, the connected element. And so what's nice about that is um, when you do, if we look at, uh, let's just jump down here to the initial analysis and kind of see the result. Um, here, if you go back up into this workflow, there's, we've exposed some parameters here within this beam lattice generation um, uh, part of the workflow, uh, the unit type, the scale, the thickness. And what's nice with these tight constraints, if you're using, if, if this approach makes sense is if you say, okay, well, you know, now my, I want to try maybe a more dense lattice. You can just change that. The whole workflow is updating. You're, re you're rebuilding your lattice. Everything's get rebuilt and connected and you have a new analysis uh, result. And so you can start to imagine, um, you know, doing, uh, trade studies, maybe you're looking to see if, you know, this thing displaces less than a certain amount, but just having this, uh, this tie constraint, having a beam representation and this, this variety of tools, um, this is just another place where uh, it's really all about enabling these trade studies and, and being able to make design, design decisions and uh, always, you know, keep moving forward in your, in your process. Uh, the last thing is a similar, looking workflow, except in this example, it's the same lattice, but uh, we went ahead and generated a full solid mesh of the whole thing. So this might be, you know, you did some iterations with the beam representation, you got close to what you think is the right lattice parameters. Now for kind of a final step, you want to generate your uh, a, a kind of high fidelity solid mesh uh, of your structure and do some work uh, with that representation. And so really the only thing that is different is um, the mesh generation is, you know, you're just discretizing your uh, a single implicit body into an FEA mesh and then running through that uh, more or less in the same, the same workflow. Um, you can change your edge length. You can change the same types of parameters. The, the catch here is that, you know, generating a solid mesh of, of this complex of geometry takes more time than using the uh, uh, the beams and the tie constraint approach, but it, it may give you, you know, a better, uh, a better representation of the stiffness of, of the overall part and, and especially the stresses if you're, if you're concerned about the stresses at the junctions. So it's always about, you know, choosing the tools that, that are appropriate for what it is that you're looking for uh, to get the job done. So as a, um, 
one last thing. I know I kind of went through this fast and I just wanted to kind of give a, a highlight of the different sets of tools that are in the, the simulation uh, and design analysis package and, and also some ideas about, uh, you know, being able to build these workflows and automate them and, and even share them. Um, at the end of the day, you know, like I said, like when we got started, these tools are here to do those initial trade studies, to do some design exploration. Um, but at the end of the day, if you need to export out to uh, another tool, we have a whole um, set of export capabilities. So if you wanna just export a mesh, you could do that. If you want to export uh, a full analysis, you can do that as well. And so that's, I'll just show that real quick here. Basically, I'm gonna look at this analysis uh, block and I'm gonna more or less recreate it. So I'll put the boundary conditions in, I'll copy the FE model down here. And when I click on this button here to, you know, what is the export path? You can see a, a variety of options here. So um, number of different solvers are supported, Abacus, ANSYS, NASHTREN. Um, and in this case, what we're going to do is um, just export this INP file. And if you were to open that up in Abacus, you would see essentially the, the same thing here. You should have all your boundary conditions applied, all your material definition, and you can take it into a downstream tool and for verification or uh, maybe to do some more advanced physics that, that we may not support yet. But making that, um, that connection to those tools is, is something that we uh, definitely put a lot of um, effort into and, and just understand that at the end of the day, we need to connect to those types of tools because you know, that's just part of, uh, part of the reality of these engineering workflows. So I think that's all I had to show. Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot more sessions in the future where we can kind of dig into some of the details of, of uh, the capabilities, but I at least wanted to give a broad overview of what's in these tabs, what's in the simulation tab, um, and the concept of this design analysis toolkit and some of the automation capabilities and, and just start to um, share those ideas and make sure that, uh, you know, if you haven't seen it before, that hopefully it gives you some ideas of, of how to use the software in, in your own workflow. So I think we have five minutes left and there are a couple of questions here. I'm happy to take more, but um, let's see here. So the first one here for the tie constraint, did you have to mesh the lattice and bulk body separately? Yeah, so let me open up that file real quick. So here's this step here. Um, we mesh this separately, and then we kind of converted that beam lattice into an FEA mesh separately. And then when you Eventually, when you, you pick the two, you know, boundaries between the uh, this lattice and the surrounding structure, you eventually build your, your tie constraints between these nodes. Um, that's kind of what brings it together. So that we do we do build them separately. The the tie constraint connects them, um, but uh, and that's that's really the the piece that enables. You know, if we change the lattice parameter. You only have to rebuild the lattice and then rebuild the tie constraint, but you don't have to remesh your whole surrounding structure. Let's see. Can you show how to import analysis results from another program? It's a good question. So one thing, um, let's see, we have some tools. Uh, um, yes, uh, point map, so you can import the point map. There's another block to convert that to a real field, and then you can use that in the field workflow. There's, I think we have a uh, webinar coming up that goes deeper into that topic. Uh, we are gonna be working uh, towards implementing native FDA results files, but uh, this point map concept um, has, in a lot of cases, if you can translate it into that, it's a pretty generic format that, that uh, is pretty versatile. Uh, let's see. I see a question, is it possible to perform multi-component simulation? Uh, yeah, so if um, if I look at the FE model concept, you'll see that there's two inputs. There's a component list 
and uh, a connector list. And so if I just make a fresh one here. So yeah, you could have, and this, this model actually is a multi-component. So we have a component for this solid body, uh, a component for this lattice, and then they're connected with this tie constraint. If, you know, this is trying, this is effectively one part, but if you did have multiple solid bodies, um, each one of those would be a component in this list. And then they're all put together in uh, this FE model concept um, to, to assemble everything. Let's see. What is the best automatic workflow to export complex results as an STL file? Uh, let's see if I... If I understand that correctly, um, you know, if you get to um, this workflow where you have a, a mesh built, um, if you do want to export a mesh like as an STL, there's there's some tools here uh, that uh, that would allow you to do that. I think we're out of time for the moment. I think there's a couple more questions. I think we capture these and we'll be happy to uh, uh, to respond directly to those. And there's some good good questions in here that we can make some sample files and put up on our support site. That's one last thing um, while I have everyone's attention. If you get into the software um, up here in the corner, there's a support button and that should take you right to our website um, that will have um, a whole bunch of, of content up there. So do make use of that. There's a lot of good stuff up there. And um, uh, that's definitely at your at your disposal. So thank you everyone for joining. Appreciate the time. Looking forward to, to all the questions and getting back to you. And um, yeah, thank you again. Take care.